If you're a maker like me and have been tinkering around and making things over the years, you've no doubt collected uh, a lot of miscellaneous pieces. And at some point along the way, you look at that pile of miscellaneous pieces and you go, I can make something out of that. So what I got here, um, just to give you a quick rundown, here's a 500 watt variable speed spindle. It's got a collet, I believe it's ER11 size. Power supply, spindle drive, uh, some miscellaneous fittings, not even sure what they're for. Some nuts and bolts. A couple of linear rails uh, from another project, not even sure what they were from. Big chunk of aluminum. Some uh, spray painted aluminum ones, uh, pieces of metal. I think they came off this router. I think these were the original side supports, uh, but they were just simply way too thin for, for being good. Uh, and some miscellaneous scrap aluminum, some MDF, and a bracket for that motor. So in this project what we're going to do is try to make a drill press out of all this. Now I've got a large 12-inch uh, uh, drill press that I use for almost everything, but there are some small things like drilling circuit boards. Uh, sometimes I drill those by hand. And to have a nice, precise, delicate drill press uh, would be a good addition to my shop. So what I'm going to do, um, I got a few sketches that I put together. Uh, so I'm just going to loosely follow these and just kind of start working through everything. Now you're going to see me use some tools in a way that you probably haven't seen people use that tool for in the past. For example, I'll be using the table saw to machine up some of these aluminum pieces. Uh, might use a circular saw for that. Uh, my band saw, it's a woodworking band saw, but eh, sometimes I can use, uh, cut some uh, aluminum on it and so forth. I also will probably incorporate using my uh, manual mill over there into some of the machining operations. Uh, but I'm going to pretty much try to use every tool in my shop for uh, the construction on this to make it fun. Most of this will be in uh, time-lapse mode or fast motion. I won't be going into a lot of detail and I really won't be providing plans on this project because you almost need the same pile of scrap that I have to create this drill press. But if you're thinking about making a drill press, follow along. Uh, you can buy similar components, uh, similar sized and so forth to make your own drill press. So to start out with, I'm going to start working on a lot of the major components. Uh, the base, uh, the column, uh, the spindle mount plate, the side plates uh, for the uh, extension on the spindle head, uh, getting them all machined to size, getting the paint removed, and so forth. To get started on this project, the first thing I need to do is start preparing all the material. I'll be doing a lot of rough sawing over at the bandsaw to cut away the waste. And then I'll do some layout work, and then go back to the bandsaw to do more rough cutting. And that could be followed up by either using the table saw to square up an end with just a light cut, or over at the milling machine where I might, might want to mill a nice precise surface along an edge. Here you can see me trying to be more efficient with the mill. I'm going to clamp the two pieces together uh, using a C-clamp after milling it, and then I can take it out, spin it around 180 so I can mill the other end, and in that process I can be assured that both parts stay in alignment. With the parts properly reoriented for milling on the right edge, I can measure the overall length, and then when I touch the tool off to the edge, I can set my digital readout to the current size, then jog the table over to the size that I want it to be, and then mill across the part. Here you can see the motion of the mill along the y-axis and the digital readout following along with that motion. Some parts require the 
a different orientation in the vise. In this case, you'll see that I'm actually doing end milling um, as opposed to side milling uh, because it's just more efficient uh, with this long of a part rather than having to refixture it in a different way. Some parts are just simply too wide to fit between the vise jaws in their normal orientation. This style of vise gives you two options for where to put your vise jaws. Here you can see I'm moving it to the back side of the movable jaw, and that gives me a much greater clamping range with this vise. A very handy uh, feature of these vices, and it gets you out of trouble in many cases. After we get done with the milling, it's really important to take your time, deburr the parts. I generally just use a single cut file, uh, clean up the edges so that they're not overly sharp. And finally, for all the parts that I've repurposed and that were painted, I'm just going to use my random orbit sander and sand off the paint. Now it's time to move on to some more layout. I'm currently laying out uh, the holes on the front of the column area. I like to use an X-Acto knife as a scribe. I find they're very easy to control and you get a very fine, precise line. I also use the top end of the caliper as a way of measuring off of a reference edge. I've been using this layout technique for about, oh, I don't know, 40 years or so, and it's never let me down. Now I'm going to go ahead and center punch the marks uh, for the holes. And I, it's very hard to pick up the line on the camera, but I think you see it right here. Now, it just depends on how the light hits it. You can see it very clearly. But the nice thing about a scribed mark like this, I can take my spring-loaded center punch and feel that scratch find the exact spot where they cross by feeling it, even if I can't really see that well, and then I can press down and snap the mark. Now, I don't know how this will show up on camera, but I'll give you a, try to let you see how that looks. In this particular location, I'm using socket head cap screws. Uh, in, our, in the inch system, this is an 832. I'd guess it's probably about a 4, maybe a 5 millimeter range on the other side of the planet, where we use the metric system. I'm going to be using a counterbore tool, such as this, to counterbore the hole to accommodate the head, so that when the bolt is in the hole, the head is flush with the face. And this is the correct size counterbore tool. Now what I've done is I've lined it up with the hole. I brought the tool down into the hole, the pilot. You'll notice it's got a pilot diameter there. That's in the hole and now the shoulder is touching the face of the part. Now what I want to do is get my depth adjuster set so that I only go in enough to conceal the head. Here you can see the depth stop and what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my socket head cap screw so that the shoulder is resting on top of the stop location and then I'll bring my depth adjusting nut down on top of it. Now at that point it's just touching so I'll back it off a little bit and now when I run the counter bore in I should be very close to perfectly flush. Now I would recommend you put a drop of oil, if you're using a countersink tool that is, put a drop of oil in that hole to help lubricate the pilot.
This is something that I won't be able to do on the new drill press. Lower the table down so I can accommodate taller parts. Now what I'm going to do is start drilling some of the holes that will be tapped. And as mentioned earlier, I'm using 832 screws. And here's a little trick if you're not uh, that comfortable with tap drills and all that. If you're not 100% sure if you've got the right diameter tap drill, but you do have a nut, the drill should go onto the nut, and it should be pretty darn snug. And as you can see there, it fits into the hole, but it's not just flopping around down there. So I'm pretty sure that's the right tap drill for this size hole. While I've got the parts set up in the vise, I'll go ahead and put in a chamfer tool and chamfer the holes. Now they're ready for tapping. For tapping, I like to use these spiral point taps. Hopefully you can see that good enough on the camera there. Uh, the drawback to this type of tap is as you're tapping, that spiral point, notice it's a negative rake, is actually pushing the chips down into the hole. Uh, but the nice thing about it is, once you start threading it into the hole and creating or forming the, tap, the threads, you can just keep screwing it in. You don't have to do like a straight flute tap where you turn it a half a turn, back it up a half a turn to break the chip, Turn it another half a turn, back it up. So these are just a lot more efficient for me to use. Some people find them very hard. I've been using them for many, many years, and I find them a dream to work with. When building a project like this, you got to be prepared for an awful lot of drilling and tapping. It's either that or if you can, you can weld some of the stuff together, but generally that's not a good choice for precise assemblies. Uh, what I'm doing here is drilling and tapping the holes for the slides that will be put on. Those will go here. There will be two of them. Like so. And they will be cut off uh, shorter than what they really are. For efficiency purposes, I'm plunge cutting this uh, to perform the roughing operations. Once I get the center area of this wide slot cleared out, then I'll come back and finish up the side.
we got more tapping to do. And now for a little bit of pre-assembly to see how everything's kind of coming together. And if you're wondering why I milled that slot here earlier, now you understand. Unfortunately, the spread of the two rails, I couldn't move them out any further because I would have had the rail over these holes. So, you work with the area that you've got, and, well, that's all the area I had. Well, it's starting to look like a drill press. Now you'll know, right away you'll notice that there is no quill on this. All the movement, the, what would normally be referred to as the Z-axis movement, or Z-axis, depending on where in the world you are, uh, is handled by the rails back here. And that's not uncommon for uh, this type of tool. And realistically, the whole point of this machine is so that I can accurately drill circuit board material. I do an awful lot of the milling on the CNC router and even some of the drilling on it. But there's just certain times where it's easier to drill uh, directly into the circuit board with a manual machine as opposed to the CNC. So that's the whole point of this machine. So next up, I need to figure out how I'm going to have control over the feed motion. Right now I'm thinking about a lever that will pivot either here through here and then the handle would be in that area and you just pull it down by hand like so. You know, with back here. Um, another possibility is a spin wheel uh, like a typical hand wheel with a rack and pinion drive. I've got room for that in this area. Uh, the next thing after that, I also got to figure out what I want for uh, the return on this. You don't want the spindle to always be falling down. You want it to be as close to neutrally buoyant, but ideally you do want it to return up. So I could put a spring on there. I'm not a big fan of springs. I often find that they uh, end up creating more problems than they solve over time. So pretty much my mind is set on having a counterbalance of some sort. Uh, that way I can very precisely control the counteraction or the counterweight for the counteraction of gravity working on this piece. Uh, with a counterweight, uh, I can set that very, very precisely. And the advantage of that over a spring, no matter where we are along the motion here, the reactionary force is exactly the same. Gravity doesn't change, but a spring, the further you pull apart a spring, the greater the tension can increase. Of course, that's depending on the type of spring and its overall length. Uh, so, that'll be the next things to figure out, and then we can move on. Found this piece in my uh, metal pile. It's uh, 3 8 inch thick one inch wide. I think it's going to make a great handle. And now I just got to come up with which method I'm going to use. It'll just be a simple lever type uh, actuator. So you'll pull down on the handle uh, as a lever and that'll push the drill into the workpiece. Um, but I got to uh, come up with a couple of decisions here. On this end here uh, I've got to be compliant to the varying distance between this surface and this surface as we go through the rotation of the handle. Two ways you can handle that. You can either add another linkage uh, that pivots at this point and at this point, but they're further apart like so. Um, or I can just put a slot in here, which I kind of got a hunch right now is going to be the most simplistic uh, of the two choices. So. Let me ponder that for a little bit and I'll show you what we come up with.
for both the pivot and the slot, I'm using a nylon flanged bushing. Pick that up at the hardware store along with some nylon washers and a shoulder bolt uh, of the appropriate size. And when this is all stacked together like so, the shoulder length is still longer than all those components. So when I tighten up the shoulder bolt, like so, there's still some slop in there. And that way, of course, it doesn't bind. So I can tighten up both of those screws good so they don't come out. And I've got enough play in them for good, precise control. Turning my attention now to the electronics, I've got to mount up the power supply and the spindle drive underneath the uh, drill press. And as you can see, I've got my four legs already mounted on here. Uh, those are 3D printed. Um, couldn't find anything scrap to, to work for that. I've got some scrap aluminum that I cut some brackets out of, some little angle brackets that'll go on the side of the power supply. Uh, this uh, spindle driver, I found this bracket. Um, it's gonna be kind of tricky, but I think I can get this lined up on here where I can get four holes to mount this to the bracket and then cut away the excess material. So hopefully we can save that piece of scrap. But right now I'm just gonna Get these angle brackets on the power supply, transfer the whole locations to the underside of the base, drill press base, drill and tap those holes, and then I'll figure out where I'm going to mount this. Uh, for the switches, uh, there will be an on-off switch that will be mounted here at the front, as well as a speed control uh, potentiometer. That will be mounted in the front panel underneath the drill press. Now that we've got the power supply mounted and a bracket for the spindle drive, things are starting to transition into final assembly. I've got legs here, and in between each of these legs will be a, a piece of uh, black uh, wood that'll be in uh, to create like a skirt so you don't see all the guts underneath. At the front, uh, here's what the leg looks like. At the front, will be this 3D printed piece, as are the legs, and this will be uh, the power switch here, and this one will be for the potentiometer, which is right here. And what I'm doing is testing this out to make sure that forward is forward and reverse is, well, I don't have a reverse, but I need to make sure that the motor is going forward. So it needs to spin clockwise from above, and we've got rotation correct. And speed is increasing as I rotate the potentiometer clockwise. And that's running wide open. As you can tell, it's for a very inexpensive Chinese motor, it actually runs pretty good. It's not very well balanced. I think most of the problem is up here on this plastic fan assembly. Uh, but it certainly does run true, and it's very quiet to operate, which will be certainly nice in the shop. So. That tests out my wiring. The only thing missing from the circuit is the power switch. And of course that uh, shouldn't be too, too problematic getting that wired in here. So from here we just continue on with wiring and assembly underneath and building up on the top. So we'll give you some peeks of that along the way. Alright, now I'm just trying to tidy up the wires here. Um, what I gotta do 
Uh, this will fit over here. This is the front cover, uh, power and uh, speed control. And of course we got mains voltage in here, so I wanted this uh, cover here to cover this so that I can't accidentally reach up in there and you know get zapped and all that fun stuff. That, that would be kind of a make for a nasty day. So, doing a little tidy up, and then we can move on to mechanical assembly. Unfortunately, I uh, forgot to push the record button apparently a couple of times while making this component. Uh, this is the device that uh, the belt, which attaches the counterweight to the uh, spindle carriage, uh, this is how we transfer that uh, motion from the front to the back. Uh, it's made up uh, basically, I think it's three quarter inch thick aluminum and I just milled out a couple of slots on the milling machine for clearance of the rollers. The rollers are hardware store items, they're nylon bushings, uh, and they spin on axles that are made out of a brass rod, which uh, luckily I had laying around here in the shop. And for an idea of scale, uh, the brass rod that serves as the axles are 0.25 inches in diameter, one quarter inch in diameter. Now currently I've got the reels on, they're just loose. Now there's two steps to getting these set up properly on any type of machinery or device. One of them will have to become the master. and That'll be the one that you set up so that it's perfectly perpendicular or parallel to whatever uh, you're trying to build. In this case, I want this to be perpendicular to the base. So that way all my holes, as the drill bit's going through, it's going straight into the hole and not going down at an exaggerated angle like this. So I'm going to use the most precise tool I've got as a machinist square. I'm going to bring that up against this linear rail and I'm going to adjust it so that it's perfectly square to this. Then the next step will be to put a joining bar between this rail and this rail which will be this piece, and then I'll set this rail parallel to this one. They must be parallel in this axis, this axis, and this way. So you really have to start with your first rail being as straight and perpendicular or parallel to your reference as you can make it. Okay, now I'm up for my next uh, major step here. What I need to do is secure this rail to this uh, column, and I need to do that so that the distance between these rails is equal all the way down or up and down, and at the same distance apart. So to do that, I'm using a couple of parallels to help get me started square, and then I'll just carefully work my way up and down, tightening up the mounting screws of this blade to the trucks, and this rail to the cow.
when I attach my spindle back to the saddle here, I, uh, before I tighten up these screws, what I wanted to do is make sure that, again, the spindle itself has to be perpendicular to the base plate of the drill press. So that is perfectly square in both directions, this way and this way. So we've got the motion going in that direction, and now I know my tool, the actual drill, is perpendicular to the base plate. Now I can go ahead, mount up my handle, Now I gotta admit, I'm not real happy with the fit between these, uh, using all the standard hardware, this nylon bushing back here, and the way I machine this slot, there's a good chance I'll end up uh, making a new one at some point, once I get a little more used to uh, how everything's operating. So far we're looking pretty good. Just a few more details and we can call this project done. down to the last few steps here and that's uh, tidying up the wiring. I've got some corrugated uh, wire wrap here. Not my favorite thing but it works well in these applications. And I designed and 3D printed some of these termination blocks that help guide my wires through and give a place to attach the corrugated tubing. It's also split uh, so you can kind of work with this stuff pretty well. So we'll just tuck that down in there, throw a zip tie on for good measure, tighten up some screws and we'll be ready to test it. That's just amazing. Right now what I've been doing is drilling a ten thousandths of an inch diameter hole through this circuit board material. That's a quarter of a millimeter, 0.25 millimeters. That's a pretty astounding feat for a shop made tool or any tool for that matter to give you that precise control so you can do it accurately. Now, uh, as mentioned earlier on in this project, this is a 500 watt spindle, Chinese made, bought it off of either eBay or Amazon, might even have been AliExpress. Uh, it's got an ER11 collet, and that certainly helps with the ability for this to drill a precise hole. Now, I've been using my large uh, woodworking drill press for many years to drill holes in circuit boards. Most of the holes I drill are in that uh, 0.7 millimeter and larger 
which would work out to about a 32nd of an inch in larger, or 33 thousandths. On that tools work great, but you just don't have that precise control. So this little baby, uh, I, I'm really pleased with how it's allowing me to have great control over this drilling process. Now I will add on a, a, a task light, a LED task light at some point. I've got another video for how to make those uh, elsewhere on this uh, YouTube channel, so you can check that out. Uh, if it turns out to be something really clever or unique, I'll, I'll put up uh, another video about that. Uh, but for a small precise drill press made out of essentially mostly scrap materials, things that I was really had no use for or had been used and are repurposed, I'm really pleased with it. Hopefully along the way in this construction process you picked up some uh, new techniques or new tricks on how to do things, how to be maybe a little more efficient in your shop. So with that I'm going to conclude this project or conclude it. I appreciate you taking the time to watch it and I hope to see you in future videos. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe. That's how I can survive making these videos. Thanks again for watching.